Welcome to Exploring the New World, Remote Exploitation of SQLite and Curl. Um, I was going to try to pronounce this gentleman's names, but instead I have their English names. So we have Leon, <laughs> Nikki, and Alien. Uh, that's much easier for me to pronounce. Um, we ask you that you uh, please silence your cell phone. And uh, please give a warm welcome to our speakers from Tencent Play team. Thank you. OK, thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay. Thank you for coming. We are very excited to share our research at Black Hat. The title of our talk today is Exploring the New World, Remote, Re Remote Exploration of Stoker Night and Curl. First, let me introduce my colleague and myself. This is my teammate, Chen Wenxiang. He is a senior security researcher at the Tencent Blade team. Now he is focusing on browser security and IoT security. He is interested in how the ODLT and write a security book, and he is also a speaker of DEF CON and CSS. And this is Niu Xiang. He is a senior security researcher at the Tencent Blade team. Now he is focusing on mobile security and IoT security. He has discovered many vulnerabilities in Android. He's also a speaker of Hacking the Box, CSS, and SCOM. And my name is Wu Hui Yu. You can call me Nikki. I'm also a senior security researcher at the Tencent Blade team. I'm a bug hunter and a geek pan winner. I'm also a speaker of DevCom, Hacking the Box, and the POC. Next, I will introduce the Tencent Blade team. Our team was funded by Tencent Security Platform Department at 2011. Oh, sorry, 2017. And, and now we are focusing on security research in areas such as AI, IoT devices, mobile devices, cloud, and the blockchain. Now we have report, reported more than 200 security vulnerabilities to many companies, such as Google, Apple, Amazon. <coughs> Microsoft, and so on. And you can connect us at uh, blade.tencent.com. OK, let's briefly look at the agenda. In the first part, we will introduce our main research result on SQLite and Curl. In the second part, we will share details on how to discover SQLite and Curl vulnerabilities through manual ODLT and fuzzy. In the third part, we will share how to explore these vulnerabilities to complete report, remote attacks. Finally, we will summarize our research. Okay, let's start with the first part. So, why do we target the, the, those two libraries? First, we think third-party third libraries are always sweet. They have less code and focused on functions. Second, almost every device had them installed. Last, the most important thing is our goal was to break Google Home, and Google Home or Google Chrome are using them too. The web circle makes remote attacks where SQLite are available in Chrome. And the car was born to be working remotely. After research, we finally found the three security vulnerabilities in SQLite. We named them Magellan, which allows us to implement remote, remote code execution on the Chrome browser in Google Home. We also found two vulnerabilities in Curl. We named them Gans, which allowed us to remotely attack Apache and the PHP or Git. OK, my part ends here. We are continuing to continue to share the latter part. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Now I will continue with part two, fuzzing and uh, manual auditing the SQLite and lab curve. Um, before introducing the code audit part, I would like to mention some previous researches. First, Michael Zawiski's fuzzing has significantly improved the quality of uh, SQLite. And then there's a talk on Black Hat in 2017, which also explains the idea of exploiting SQLite. 
After that, there doesn't seem to be a lot of new news about the vulnerabilities of Circulite, but we have found some. In the next part, we will introduce the code auditing and exploiting of Magellan, a set of vulnerabilities in Circulite, and DS, which is a set of vulnerabilities in LabCurl. The Chromium project comes with a father for Circulite. We made some simple changes to it, such as adding some syntax-based files. And when we looked back, we found that there was a lot of crash files generated. However, these test cases can only trigger empty pointer dereferencing. One of these crashes is caused by duplicate primary keys. And when I was debugging, I typed the first three create table statements to see what was going on in memory. However, I was surprised to find that dot .table command showed the six tables. The question is, what those content CDR segments stand for? The SQLite manual shows that these tables are called shadow tables. There are five, tables, uh, there are five types of shadow tables, which is uh, content CDR segments. They are for FTS3 or FTS4, and state and doc size are for FTS4 only. However, because of those tables are treated like standard tables, you can create corresponding state and doc size table, even if you are operating on an FTS3 table. You can create state and doc size by simple create a table statement, because Circulite itself is doing this too. And FTS3 and FTS4 is sharing some code, which means state and doc size might change the code flow in some conditions. For example, one of our exploits are simulating an FTS4 table on FTS3 environment. This is useful because some software like Chromium uses only FTS3 and explicitly disabled FTS4. This would extend the attack surface by entering some code branch that should never be entered. The shadow table is used as a container to store the content of full text search metadata. What's shown on this slide is the definition and meaning of each shadow table. We can see that almost every shadow table has a field of type block. That's because to support full text queries, FTS maintains an inverted index that maps from each unique term or word that appears in the data set to the locations in which it appears within the table contents. It is complicated, but all we know is that, compared to other fields, those blobs may have some important influence on FTS queries. In Circulite, the raw binary data is typically represented in the form of X single quotation mark and hexadecimal numbers. However, the blobs here are binary data to represent the entire B tree. And since it represents such a complex structure, is it possible to create a memory correction vulnerability by destroying the data of the structure? Let's read about the document of the serialized data structure first. You can read the circulate menu to easily get the definition. I will show you a simplified version so you can understand what I'm modifying or I'm trying to exploit them. Basically, I'm modifying the bytes with different functional sections to mislead the code flow. The first segment B tree leaf nodes. The first term stored on each node, which is term one in the figure above, is stored verbatim. Each subsequent term is prefix compressed with respect to each predecessor. predecessor. In the real nodes, non-leaf nodes has different structure than the doc list format. A doc list consists of an array of 16-4-bit signed integers, serialized using the FTS variant format. Each doc list entry is made up of a series of two or more integers as follows. One, the doc ID value, and two, zero or more term offset lists. In general, those blobs are just serialized B tree data. When the circulite wants to perform operations on these tables, it will simply deserialize, uh, parse those blobs, and get a complete B tree. Now our goal is to find the operations associated with those blob nodes. When I'm auditing it, I first come to find those related code passes, which are risky. Also, Circulite provides a complete code file named Circulite Amalgamation. 
It combines all .c and .h files into one .c file with about 200,000 lines, which will help you locate the function easily. The screenshot is captured from this um, Gaussian file. Then I have found some problems. The problems are mainly related to the merge and match. Because they are deeply related to the B tree, two of them merges the nodes of the tree, and other is to traverse the nodes of the tree to match the content. Also, the last one is the crash I have mentioned before. It was that brought this series of problems into my attention. Software must enable FTS3 support and support external SQL query to trigger these problems. Okay, let's begin with the uh, first one, uh, 20346, which is also the main vulnerability we use later to exploit Google Home. This one requires a lot of complex preconditions. That is, we have to carefully construct a lot of tables and content. But once the preconditions are met, vulnerability exploitation will be very simple and stable. The vulnerability is located in the function FTS3 append to node. It can be triggered with a spatial semantic, the merge equals one, two, which means the level to be merged. As you can see, this function will try to append a node to another. The node is stored in the blob, so this function and upper function will first pass in the B tree and then get the start position and the length of binary data of the node that will be processed. Last, perform, an, uh, perform the memory copy operation to copy them into a new blob that represents the new tree. Let's go back to the caller function, the turncate node. It will get the binary offset and length from the blob data that will describe the node being processed. Then the node information is returned in a reader object passed to the vulnerable FTS3 append to node. To control the memory copy in append to node, we need to control a doc list and n doc list returned from the node reader next. The a doc list is the source of the char pointer of the blob data, and n doc list is the node size which are the second and third parameter of memory copy. To control them is not a difficult thing. Let's read the code, then you will know why I'm saying that is easy. To save the space of storing an integer, SQLite uses a variant integer algorithm. You can just consider fs get variant 32 as a function to convert a bunch of bytes into an integer. It will store the results in n suffix. Then it moves the current cursor by adding the count of bytes it have read to I off. The data for a node is stored as length, following by corresponding data with exactly the size of length. Normally, they should appear in pairs. Uh, sorry, they should appear in pairs, but we can modify the blob to make the end of the blob boundary has only the length field but no data field. Then the I off will point to the front of length. An end doc list is obtained from the blob normally. The I off is moved to the boundary, and in the line one, two, three, a doc list is set to this position. Also, the critical assert in line one, two, nine will not stop I off because it is void in the release version. The line one, three, zero, uh, which is a controlled a doc list and end doc list is returned here. And let's go back to the append to node. Since we have a doc list and n doc list controlled, we can all follow the buffer of p node a in line 310. Or we can copy some raw memory data to it, as long as it doesn't exceed the aligned value. Then we can query the new table to get the leaked raw memory. By setting up adjacent tables, we can all follow the function pointers of table very accurately to exploit a code, code execution. Okay, here's another one. This one is in function FTS3 scan interior node. And the precondition of this one is rather simpler than 20346. All you need to know is modify the shadow table and set a node in secdr to non-root node. You can change the blob data to change the code flow. Query the modified table by keyword match, and then the code will scan every node inside the B tree. Then the code will trigger memory corruption in line 184. Let's analyze the code to see why this one is vulnerable. First, get variant 13 2. As we have mentioned before, it will return an integer from at most half the maximum value of a 
32-bit uh, integer. The code obtains n suffix and n prefix from the blob data. Cn is simply pointing to the last item in the CSR. If we get a big n suffix and a small n prefix, the CSR is a char pointer. In 32-bit environment, address of the first item of the CSR plus n suffix will overflow the unsigned integer that represents the address and become a smaller address. In this condition, it will pass the check. And also, because the n prefix and n suffix are signed integer, the sum of two numbers is less than zero. So it will pass the second check. Coincidentally, it prevents reallocation from reporting a value memory relocation. And in the line 184, the program will try to copy data from the CSR with a large n suffix, resulting in a heap buffer overflow. In 16-4-bit environment, you can make n prefix very large to make the program copy to the buffer plus n prefix. Because it has many constraint conditions and it was considered to be very hard to exploit on IoT devices, also, it is very not stable to exploit, so uh, we are not exploiting with this, but this one is exploitable anyway. Please check the wonderful write-up by a Korean researcher named Anki Chen. And the last one, 20505. This one is very like to a combination of the previous two vulnerabilities. The vulnerable function is seg segreader next. You can modify the shadow table and mislead the code flow. So here, the P reader should be controlled first. P reader is very like the reader object in the 346, uh, which is a node in blob. Then the code part is like the previous one. The n suffix and n prefix is obtained to exploit this function. The sum of them needs to be overflowed to pass the check in line 759. And then the data will be copied from p next to z term plus n prefix with the size n suffix, which is very like the condition of 20506. Just like the other two vulnerabilities, because the address and the size of the memory copy are controllable, we can also use it to read some raw memory without assigning such a large value to the two variables. All three vulnerabilities can be modified to leak raw memories, so we can also use this to leak address of, for example, functions, structures, global variables, constant variables to bypass ASLR. And since our target is remote code execution, but libcurl has already been used by a lot of users, and their code iterates very quickly too. To find a vulnerable function, here are two guidelines for finding problems by reading the code quickly. First, find big functions. Functions with a lot of lines is not recommended in software engineering. And functions that are too long should be refactored into a shorter function fragment. Usually, such large function is difficult to test, and there will be a lot of attack service. And then, protocol that communicates with remote machine. This is an important condition for remote attacks. But fortunately, most of the functions enabled in LabCurl is related to remote interactions and communicates with a remote server more than once. After carefully sifting through the protocols, we confirmed that NTLM over HTTP was what we want to test. The use of NTLM over HTTP protocol authentication is indicated by an HTTP authentication scheme, NTLM. The authentication parameters that are exchanged are base 64 encoded messages. RFC 2616 has a definition, so here's a simple chart of a six-stage handshake or authentication. The client and the server will communicate many times. Please note the three type message I marked in red are where we have found vulnerabilities in. Uh, here's an example. The type 2 message is encoded by base 64, and here is an example of a decoded type 2 message shows an encoded hexadecimal form. They are grouped into a whole message in a predefined order. For example, this message has a length of 98 bytes, which is represented by the, shorter, by the short, short integer 16200. And here are those problems we have found in LabCurl. We named them as Dias. It's the name of another famous navigator. 
The first one, 16H90, is a vulnerability in NTLM type 2 message. It can leak at most 64 kilobytes client memory per request to attacker. The result is very like to hurt bleed, but it's a client version. And the second one, 3H22, is a vulnerability in NTLM type 3 message. It will result in a stack buffer overflow. LabCurse also wrote in his blog, thought this is a very bad security issue. Let me show you how this happened. First, the H90. The vulnerable function is NTLM decode type 2 target. It uses curl read 32 LE to read a 32 bit integer from the type 2 message header. Then we know we can set target info offset with a larger value. And target info learn to a value which, if you add them together, an integer overflow will happen. The overflow value is very small and it will pass the check in line 185. And then memory copy will copy data out of bounds. For example, if we use a value above, it will actually copy the data from the uh, front of variable buffer in 32 bit environment. And then the data will be sent to attacker in type 3 message, leaking maximum 164 kilobytes data per request to attacker. And let's go through the other one, 3822. This vulnerability is located in a big function named curl auth create NTLM type 3 message. In the beginning, this function declares a lot of variables on stack memory. The NTLM buffer is a big buffer which has around a kilobyte memory. Then in line 590, the function tries to read NT response length from the type 2 response, which is sent from the server. Attacker could return a value bigger than the buffer size to client. In line 779, this check should check if the size of the data is bigger than NTLM buffs remaining size. But the inexplicit signed unsigned cast prevents the check from operating correctly. And then, because NT response length is bigger than the remaining size of NTLM buff, hence here will be a stack buffer overflow. Let's take a closer look at this, which is the function that describes the length field from the type 2 message. You can see that this is a bad habit. The code defines a mathematical operation with variables in the macro. But the macro looks like a constant. I guess if you are a software tester or a developer working on code review, you will probably think this is just a fixed value, thus ignoring the potential risks here. If the value is larger than the buffer, it will be the mistake one. And another mistake is that's back to the curl or script NTRM type 3 message. This check compares again two unsigned variables and a macro. This macro simply defines a number, 1024, but this value is considered to be a signed integer in the view of a compiler. When unsigned and signed are compared in the same place, some of them must be casted in order to compare correctly. And this is the problem. The compiler prefers the convert signed to unsigned numbers. So if we have NT response length greater than the NTRM buff size, the result will be a large unsigned number, and it is, of course, bigger than the remaining size, and we'll pass this check. And here's the mistake three. When the code triggers a stack buffer overflow, the overflowed variant is in the middle of a lot of stack variables. Although there may be stack cookies, an attacker could choose not to overflow that much bytes, but instead overwrite the stack variance and control the flow of the code. I have marked the position where it triggers a buffer overflow. You can see, in this big function, there are 18 lines after it, and many of them are operating heap or stack memory. And the operating is based on the value of those stack variables. That's the reason why I say big function is never good coding practice. The stack buffer flow um, might turn to a heap buffer overflow in line 833 based on the implementation of a curl convert to network because this function pointer could be overwritten in different programs or leak raw memory, memory data to attacker by overwriting different stack variables or just perform an old school stack buffer overflow to get a remote code execution. Okay, my part is over, and my partner, Li Yuxiang, will now introduce how to exploit some of those vulnerabilities. Thank you. Okay. 
Thanks for my partner's introductions. Now I will continue with the part three, remote exploitations of uh, measurements and uh, DS. First, let us introduce how to remotely exploit the uh, um, measurements vulnerabilities. The possible effects uh, products are listed below. Chrome, our browser, developed uh, develop based on the Chrome use, uh, Android apps that use the web view, the smart devices using Chrome and Chrome use. Why do we choose the um, Google Home as our target? Because Google Home is a uh, smart speaker uh, device uh, with a large market share, and it uses Chrome OS. Next, we will introduce how to use the measurements to attack the Google Home. In these sections, we will show you how to extend the attack surface of Google Home. First, let's introduce the basic knowledge about CAS protocol. Google allows developers to develop CAS app to, uh, and public it to application store. In general, the CAS app includes senders and receivers. Sender devices uh, may be mobile devices or the PC running Chrome. Receiver is a Google's IoT device such as Google Home. The entire architecture is, uh, is as follows. The user assess the sender application URL and the sender applications use the CAST protocol to find the receiver in the LAN. When the receiver, receiver is discarded, the sender's applications will communicate directly with the uh, receiver application on the receiver uh, with the, via the CAST protocol. In detail, the Google Homes will prove the URLs of each receiver application according to the CAST app ID and accept the receiver application through the uh, Chrome renders. After our attempts, we can uh, we find that the CAST protocol will have the following security risk, including one, the CAST app can be any web page. If our given a receiver uh, app is a web page with malicious payloads, Google Home will still visit it. Uh, two, the cast app in the app stores may be malicious. Unlike Google Play, cast app stores, there is no much strict security audio mechanisms. Send address, senders can directly trigger cast protocol. We, we may even require no user interactions. Based on this security risk, we can govern an attack on a Google Home into attack on a browser. Let's take a look at uh, some spe specific steps. The attacker is registered as a CAST developer. CAST application can be developed and distributed. When you publish an application, you need to specific CAST receiver URL. However, Google does not audio links and CAST APPs only require links to the HTTPS. Uh, when we can specific is as the web page with uh, any context. Remotely trigger Google Homes to accept any web page. If the attackers and Google Homes are in the LAN, the attackers can also send the CAT protocol, such as the launch app request. This request will directly trigger Google Home accept to the CAT receiver URL to make a master words if the routers in the victim's home turn on the UPnP um, Ports for links, the attacker can also complete the remote silent attacks on the internet. The attacker modify cast receiver URL web page to malicious page, then Google Home may, may um, assist in the render after visiting the page. Now, let's review the following vulnerabilities. The keys to the vulnerability triggers is how to use the inserted data to control the variable used by our memory copy function. The variables uh, here is including P node A, P node N, A dot list, N dot list. The inserted data is as follows. First, the entire data is stored in the buffers of P node A. We can control the size of the P node A buffer by modifying the length of the inserted data. Uh, in HIP functions, we are able to allow P node A to the appreciate areas to uh, cover the target's memory. In, in this status, the orange colors 
in that case, there's the size P no n and a n dot x from left to right, which is where in type. N dot x is used to control the lens to be overflow. P node n, which is the offset of the overwritten memory areas. The green part is the A dot x data, which can be used for O B write or be read. Uh, I will be read. The next section, uh, we will introduce the ideas of using these vulnerabilities. We expect to find a, fun a function pointer that can be used on the heap. When creating uh, FTS3 tables, the tokenizer is created by default, and the tokenizer default is the simple tokenizer. As shown in the following pictures, a simple tokenism is a structure on the heap where it, his member space points to the SQL trees uh, tokenism structures. The member P models of the SQL uh, trees tokenism structure points to the tokenism models. The tokenism models contain some interesting callback function such as as create or as uh, open. On more lens, when inserted FTA3 tables, the xopen callback functions will be triggered if the function address of xopen can be modified to an HBRIS address and PC can be hijacked. How to use this uh, liberal function pointer for PC hijacking? Here, two conditions need to be met. First, after the hit overflow, it's necessary to be able to operate uh, the FTA3 table. In a, in addition, the hijacking need to be complete before the memory is released, otherwise the crash will be interrupted. By analyzing the loss codes of the memory copy to free, uh, we found an interesting function which performs a SQL update operation before res uh, releasing the memory, as shown in the blue tag of code. Finally, we can use the SQL trigger to perform a FTA3 table insert operation before the SQL update operations and free memory, since triggering the X open callbacks. The next stage to make the memory layouts, uh, the SQL logicals of the cache shell use the TMLOCK. A, a feasible memory layout idea is the follow. First, by creating multiple FTA3 tables, we, we will create multiple, um, multiple Simple tokenizer structures drop the previous appropriately created FTS3 tables at the appreciated time, the simple tokenizer structure will be free. Reassigning payloads of the same size as simple tokenizers, it has a high uh, prob probability that payloads will be allowed to the pre previously ch um, changed or released simple tokenizer structures. So our payload has a great change to overwriting the simple tokenism structure of the existing FTA3 tables. With the SQL triggers that perform the operation of the FTA3 table before the freeze, there is a change that the to tokenism model copy function will be triggered. When we have the ability to hijack the PCs and control the R0, we only need to be able to list information and bypass ASL up. The previous section also introduced we can try to adjust the n dot leaks and P node A and leak the memory after HIV. We need to disclose the following two types of address, taking the address of the cat shell. Based on this address and offset, calculate the required RP gadgets, leaking the address of blood heave according to of this address and offset the probabilities of calculating the address of the heat spray. The last is the heat spray and uh, RLPs. After these two steps, we can see in the Chrome uh, Google Home's renders, uh, Castle Shell is a large binary program that contain many of the available RLP gadgets. So the RLP gadget using Castle Shell is more stable and convenient. Um, in the matrix on the right, the red light marks the marks the heat spray unit with face tokenizers, models, and RP gadgets. The X on 
uh, X creates an open <coughs> address interface, tokenism model structure will be assigned the stack pivot address. The blue lines mask our face simple tokenizer structures. When the FTS tree table operation can be triggered, SQLite will be uh, will get a modular X open through the structures of the simple tokenisms, and then I see. Above is the source query of our RC in the cluster shell. The rigs box on the left show that's the register we can control. There are R0, R11. The function address is read from R11 and finally uh, go to the BRX lens. As a result, we, can, uh, we have been able to hijack the pieces. The pictures on the right show that's the result of our shell codes. We execute, uh, executed the JavaScript codes for fetch URLs. Navigators app NAND in the X, exp then doc at gml code normally uh, the um, navigators application NAND is read only and is next case but our shell code changed the app NAND to a let's look at some actual attack sense there are two uh, two types of the attack vectors that attack Google Home remotely one one them is needs to in the land. First, the attackers is low located in the LAN. The attacker send the launch app once command through the cat protocol and Google Home through the leaf doc HTML on the application's market according to the app ID and load it. At these times, the leaf states can be obtained by the attackers. Second, the attackers send the launch app ID to commands. At this time, Google Home Loads exp doc at gmail so that the RC happen. The entire process does not require user interactions. In the other two sense, you don't need to be on the same land, uh, the same lens to start the attacks. The attacker inducts the victims to access the URL of the sender application. The Chrome browsers will prompt the user to select the device, and the users will start the attack process after confirmation. We can scan the networks on the routers that may have UPMP's foldings try to launch a remote attacks. The previous sections introduced the exploit of the Magellan's and LANs. We will introduce the framework of the developer sense and how to exploit the DR's vulnerabilities in these models. Developers may also be target or the attacks. The um, pieces or the or servers used by the developer may store data related to the companies. If the developer is attacked, there are many there may be unspecked gains. The necessary tools that developer use in developments may have security risk. The proxy servers used the used in development may also be attacked. Networks related to the past libraries will be an attack surface as shown in the picture below. If the developer is attacked by an attacker or ARP DNS proofings are setting the malicious service or the internet, then it may be attacked by the attackers. In the inter in internal network environment, if the proxy server's frequency assets of use by the developer is, con is controlled, then it is also possibility to launch an attack from the proxy servers to the developer. Let's review the details about DS. By constructing a malicious NTL type 2 message, DS can leak information and stay buffer overflow and stay overflows on lab curves. The keys to triggering the entire vulnerability is the server. It is not important whether whether the client's aggregations require is correct or not. We only need to face a malicious servers, and after receiving the client's NTL request, we can launch an attack. In in curse and lab curse, there are some requirements for opening NTL aggregations. Curse supports NTL aggregation by default, whilst lab curse require um, Aggregation NTLM or any to support NTL aggregation. The specific, uh, the specific attacks 
sends is as follow. Provide that the NTL aggregations request is enabled. Once the, the developer use Git to prove the repositories, for example, the documents are specific uh, malicious repositories address. To use you use curse or relay on lab curse software to accept the proxy server. If the proxy ser server is malicious, it, it can be con it can be attacked. Three, the text PHP file is placed on the servers. On the attacker upload the web shell, the PHP file will not be detected by the detection surveyors, but it will become the backdoors of the servers. As shown in the pictures on the right, if the client has already triggered the NTL request in the three sense lens, only the malicious server need to be returned a malfunct NTL type two message. Then the client's memory may be leased to the attacker through the NTL type three message. It can even lead to code exactions. This is the bit light uh, effect of hard bit, but there are some preconditions that require us to control the developer to accept a link. This slide shows the malicious NTLM type 2 message returned by the servers. This is the malicious payload encoded by base64. The specific real day is as follows. The entire payload is very simple. It is a basic message of NTLM type 2. The original the or origin numbers corresponding to the target info land and the blues number correspond to the target info object. By controlling these two variables, the data will be sent to the attackers when the clients reply to the NTM type three message. Let's take a look at the client's hot blood. Let's take Git and curse as an example. The local host IP is the server that has been controlled by an attacker. The attacker deploy a malicious NTL, NTLM servers. When the developers use keys or curse to accept the networks, for example, uh, execute the following git command and the uh, curse commands, they will trigger the process of NTLM aggregations and lens, it may be attacked by the attackers. From the two short, uh, screenshots, you can see the gifts and the curves return the data in their memory to the servers. The attackers can obtain the developer memory information by inducting the development to execute the above two command. In addition to the hard place of the clients, there is actually a a sense that may cause the hot blade of the servers. We use Apache and PHP as an example. If, one, uh, if on one of our servers, the attacker upload the web shell, the web shell does not do malicious behaviors, just a, uh, just a program that that's use libcurs to set the network, so it is possible not detect, do not detect by security, security software. So it will always exist on the servers for the long time. The screenshot below is our PHP code. Uh, we accept the attacker malicious NTLM servers very close. The attacker can secretly the memory to remote NTLM servers by accessing the PHP. In addition, uh, is even is even possible to RC. Conclusion. Here is the timeline of Magellan's we have we have report land in the November and is quickly fixed by SQLite and Chromios. In the December, in December, Google decided to get a, a total ten thousand rewards for this batch of vulnerabilities. And they have a enhancement that is a defense in the flag this allowing modifying shadow tables from untrust source. For backwards compatibilities is default off in SQLite. So you are using SQLite with FTS, you may want to enable this one to prevent an attacker from modifying your shadow tables. But the good news is the default on in 
Chrome from commit in last November. Here, the timeline of DIAST is quickly fixed and released by uh, lab crews in two weeks. Also, uh, we have not notified the CNCERT to urge vendor disable the vulnerable FTS trees or web secures before the patch come out. And we have notified security teams of Apple's, Intel's, Facebook's, Microsoft about how to fix the problem of how to mitigate the phrase in the sums of their products. Here's some security advice for the software developers. Once enhance your systems with the newly available defense in diff mechanisms in, in time. Two, keep your third pass libraries up to date. Three, improve the qualities of security audit Auditing and testing on the third-party libraries. Fourth, introduce security specifications into developments and testing. Thank you. So, any questions? Maybe we can talk about it uh, later. Okay. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you.